We start now with the discussion of the Brill Building, or, or more specifically, the Brill Building approach to popular music. In many ways, the Brill Building is the, is the successor to the Tin Pan Alley approach that we discussed in the first week. It's, a, it's an approach that is very much focused on music publishing. It's an approach to popular music that really is driven by songwriters and the interests of songwriters in publishing uh, and this kind of thing. And in fact, the Brill Building as a physical place is the place where most of the Tin Pan Alley um, songwriters still had their offices. The people that we're going to talk about that were involved with Teen Pop were actually a couple of blocks down the street. We always call it Brill Building, but most of these people didn't actually have offices uh, in the Brill Building. The Brill Building is at 1619 Broadway, but you've got to go up to 50 51st Street to 1650 Broadway to get to the actual offices uh, where some of these folks were, but more about that uh, in just a minute. The, the Brill Building approach, uh, again, returns us back to a, to, to a time when songwriters do the songwriting, uh, performers do the performing, and publishers do the publishing, and we have a, a rise now of the role of the producer, which is a, a record producer, which is a, a, a new thing that happens. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, Let's start with a, a discussion of Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller are probably in the period up to the arrival of the Beatles and Dylan in the 60s, maybe the most important songwriters in rock history up to that point. Lieber and Stoller started out writing songs in Los Angeles. Uh, they were a couple, of guy, a couple of white guys who really um, in many ways uh, uh, blended in and became part of the African-American community in Los Angeles. Um, they hung out in the African-American community, they, the way they tell the story, uh, they, uh, they had black girlfriends, their friends were black, they hung out in those clubs, uh, always treated respectfully and, and the, uh, as Jerry Lieber likes to say, we thought we were black, we were wrong, but that's what we thought at the time. And so they very much embraced rhythm and blues practices, but became songwriters in that practice, uh, starting up a, a label for a short period of time, uh, Spark Records, uh, and recording songs for, uh, recording and writing songs uh, with a lot of uh, LA bands. Uh, the, the Robins was one group that they worked with. Uh, Big Mama Thornton was another one that they worked with. Big Mama Thornton, for example, is the one for whom they wrote the song, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog, which was later uh, covered uh, by Elvis Presley. Big Mama Thornton, that was in, in 1953. Uh, and it, interestingly, the version that Elvis did wasn't taken from the recording that Lieber and Stoller did of Big Mama Thornton, but rather a version Elvis heard a Las Vegas singer doing um, when he was when he was traveling through Las Vegas. He heard a guy doing a version of the song where the lyrics had been changed. Jerry Lieber says he never wrote the line, uh, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. That wasn't in uh, the original Big Mama Thornton version. But nevertheless, um, when these guys uh, had that hit with Big Mama, the Big Mama Thornton hit being picked up by Elvis Presley, all of a sudden they had a hit record and they were very hot properties uh, in the music business. And so they had, they had a certain amount of power and a certain amount of ability uh, to be able to call the shots a little bit more. They started working with a group called the Coasters, which was a version of the Robins that moved from the West Coast to the East Coast, right? So they came from the West Coast, they were called the Coasters. Not all the guys from the Robins wanted to leave LA, so some of them came with Lieber and Stoller to New York. They started to work with Atlantic Records. They had a, a, an independent deal where they could work with Atlantic Records, but they could work with other labels if they wanted to. And from the way they tell the story, they started not just writing songs, but writing records in the sense that when they wrote the song, they thought about how they wanted the record to be recorded, how they wanted the instruments to go. Now that's not normal hadn't been normal even up to that point. Usually a songwriter would write a song and it would be somebody else's job, an arranger's job or the musician's job to figure out how the songs would actually sound. But they were thinking in their head as they were doing it how they would produce these songs. And the group that they got the most ambitious with was a group called the Coasters. Um, and with the Coasters, they started borrowing songs from, uh, b borrowing ideas from Broadway uh, where the, po the Coasters would actually kind of act out these little story songs uh, that they called playlets. Um, and so Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, just as song Songwriters now for a minute, not so much worrying about producer, we'll come back to that, but as songwriters, they're some of the most important songwriters, two of the most important songwriters coming out of the 1950s into this uh, 60s uh, era. And so they're in New York, they're around the Brill Building, and the rest of the songwriters we're going to talk about in the Brill Building are really clustered around a company called Al Don Publishing. Al Don Publishing is, uh, is at 1650 Broadway, the other office I was telling you about that's a couple of uh, blocks down from the actual Brill Building. Uh, it's a, a was a, was a 
publishing company put together by Al Nevins and Don Kirshner. And the way they did it is very much sort of in the, uh, in the, in the old school mode. They had, a whole, they had a whole bunch of songwriters who wrote songs for them every day. I mean, these, these songwriters were in little cubby holes uh, with a piano and they would go in there, you could hear music through the wall, and they would be sort of working on their song and at the end of the day they would bring their song out and the, the, all the com um, songwriting uh, teams would compete with one another for who would get the record and who would get a record with which different group that they were shopping these songs to. Uh, and so it was really a kind of a, a, a pop songwriting shop or, or workshop or, or factory or something like that that was going on um, there at, at Aldon uh, Music. Here are some of the important songwriters that, that came out of that. Uh, Jerry Goffin and Carole King. We, we'll come back to uh, Carole King uh, again in the 1970s. He's one of the most important singer-songwriters. In fact, he's had a fantastic career stretching out over a couple of decades. But their first big hit, Will You Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelles, went to number one in 1960. Uh, they had a song called The Locomotion that was number one in 1961 by Little Eva, who I think, as the story goes, was actually their babysitter at the time. And they found out that she could sing. And so she sang this song, The Locomotion, and had a number one hit with it. Uh, another interesting one is Chains, a song that was done in 1962 by the Cookies that was Subsequently, co subsequently covered by the Beatles. We'll talk about the Beatles next week, but it's amazing how much of the girl group tradition the Beatles absorbed. We don't really think of them as being very much associated with girl groups. In fact, they, they owe a great uh, depth of influence uh, to girl groups. So that's Jerry, K uh, Jerry Goffin and Carole King. Jeff Berry and Ellie Greenwich were another Aldon songwriting team. Uh, two of their big hits, Be My Baby for the Ronettes in 1963, To Do Ron Ron for the Crystals in the same year, 1963. Since a while and Barry Mann, uh, one of their big hits again for the Crystals, Uptown. Neil Sadaka and Howie Greenfield, uh, Calendar Girl was a hit they had in 1961. Breaking Up is Hard to Do, a number one hit for them in 1962. A lot of those Neil Sadaka, Howie Greenfield songs were sung by Neil Sadaka, who was kind of a teen idol of his day. It's interesting that song, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, came back in 1975. Neil Sadaka did uh, a whole new version of it uh, and really had a kind of revivified career in the 1970s. But when you take all of these people together and the songwriting that's going on and producing songs, song after song after song like this, actually hit song after hit song, uh, all, all to sort of uh, in the service of this publishing company, Aldon, you really get a sense of what the Brill Building is. So from, from here forward in the chorus, whenever I refer back to Brill Building, I'm really referring back to this sort of professional uh, uh, environment of songs written specifically for the, the teen market, uh, songs written by songwriters who aren't themselves performers. Neil Sadak and Carol King kind of being uh, exceptions. Uh, but nevertheless, most of these songwriters are not performers. So now, let's take a look at the teen idols from this era.